Hall of Famer Deion Sanders said, when you dress good, you look good. When you look good, you feel good. And when you feel good, good things happen in your day to day. So that's a really good quote. And what I'm talking about today is basically extreme human performance. Okay. So we had a great conversation with Dr. Mike T. Nelson, and he's all about just how do you optimize your, your ultimate extreme human performance in all areas of your life. So we went into a really deep dive and conversation about that. So check this out with Mike. So Mike, um, we just, I just said, ready, are you ready to rock and roll? So speaking <laughs> of that, I, I saw on your Instagram um, posts and stories uh, not too long ago that you were at a couple of heavy metal uh, concerts. So I'm just interested to kick off the show. What, what got you into heavy metal? Uh, it was probably like in high school, I wasn't really into it. The first concert I ever went to was in ninth grade. I went to see Poison actually, which yeah. was actually, it was a really good show. Um, and then after that was in more in high school, I was definitely in the more alternative stuff, like red hot chili peppers, fishbone, mighty money, Boston, like all the stuff from the early nineties. And then as I went to, to college, there was this guy, uh, like halfway down the hallway, listened to this weird death metal stuff. And I was like, what? And I listened to, you know, some Metallica and just yeah. started getting into Pantera and he was listening to all sorts of like black metal. And then at first I was like, this is like. It was horrible sounding. How does anyone <laughs> listen to any of this? This is like trash. And I don't know, for whatever reason, it kind of grew on me. And when I went to Ireland my third year, I didn't, this is how old I am. Like they had the old school Walkman with like actual physical tapes and <laughs> CDs had been out for a while, but like portable CD players are not really a thing. And while I was over there, like it was really hard to get new music. So some of the metal magazines had these cassette tape samplers that would come with the magazine for the cost of the magazine. So I was like, well, I don't know, I'll buy, buy a few of these and check it out. And yeah, I just started getting into more of it since then. And then <clears throat> when I did my master's at Michigan Tech, there was a radio station there. So I ended up working as a director of loud rock music there for four years and then did a, a radio show there for four and a half years. Right on. Okay. Yeah. That's, That's fun. Awesome. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, last night I just went to a show again here. I went to see um, uh, Cavalier. Uh, well, it used to be Cavalier Conspiracy, but it's basically Max uh, and uh, his brother Igor, who were originally from the band Sepultura. Uh, Sepultura is now touring with two different members, uh, but they went back and played all their like super early stuff from their uh, early two albums. And yeah, that was really cool to see. It was super fun. Yeah, right on, man. No, it's good. I just want to just like, I'm just really interested in that because I mean, I love all different forms of music. I love rock. I just haven't really gotten yeah. to the heavy metal side of things, but great suggestions. I'll have to take a look at those. It's good workout music though. <laughs> yeah. It's always good for training too. <laughs> yeah. To me, it's just like cheap caffeine, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you hear a good song that comes on the radio, you're like, yeah. hundred <laughs> <Yeah>, percent. <laughs> all right, Mike. So I want to switch gears here and I just want to talk about kind of like your expertise, right? And I'm going to read this off. I don't want to butcher it, but you educate trainers by turning complex physiology into simple actions with your flex diet and physio flex certs, right? So if, if I had to kind of like rewind, like, you know, the tape, what got you into really wanting to have this expertise of educating trainers by turning complex physiology into simple actions with your flex cert and your physio cert as well too? I think probably because like most guys, I started, you know, I was six foot three eel shaped rake my first year in college. And I was after your growth spurt and so you start getting into, you know, lifting. And at the time I took anatomy and physiology class as an undergrad and we had a full cadaver lab there. So is at St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota, which is one of the few colleges where undergrads could actually use uh, the cadaver lab. And so I started getting fascinated by that of like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And you learn all this stuff in class. And then I realized, oh, well, if I'm lifting now, I'm actually, you know, sort of applying it to myself. And then for years, I just thought that's what everybody does, right? They read research and they apply it to themselves or other people. And then I realized mm, not necessarily <laughs> that in my brain, like having research and information, whether it's research experience, whatever, and then application, like of course they like go together and then later you realize that oh you could you know have people who are really really good at researching protein synthetic response and have never lifted or never trained that's just not part of their job and you've got a whole host of people who you know may have a lot of experience doing things and just learn things empirically and then of course in fitness you've got 
everybody in between who takes a weekend cert and they're a trainer now and they know everything. So, yep. uh, but for me, it was always, as I started teaching people more, I always tried to make things as simple as possible, but the things you're talking about are far from simple, right? So I like the phrase like physiology is complex, but your actions should be relatively simple. Hmm. So we could have a long discussion about say a deadlift, right? Oh, you just pick up a weight off the floor. We could talk about, you know, technique, internal, external cues, you know, everything to the nervous system, rate coding, muscle firing, turnover, blah, 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 blah. Right. But at the end of the day, you're not going to want to vomit all that stuff up on your client, which I've made the mistake of doing in the past. It doesn't go so well. You're going to be like, okay, push your feet through the floor, stand up. Or I want more pressure on your big toe, stand up, right? You're going to give them probably one, maybe two cues that's going to explain what it is you're trying to do. So I think for trainers, it's a little bit hard because you do need to understand some of the physiology, whether it's physiology, yeah. nutrition, yeah. et cetera. And then you're like a glorified translator, which isn't a derogatory thing at all. You then have to then on top of it, figure out, okay, what is this person who's in front of me online in person? What is the next one or maybe two things that they need to move themselves forward? So I think you kind of have to understand uh, both, especially when you're doing the application of it. Yeah. And that makes total sense. You know, and that kind of brings me to the next question of just like, where was that aha moment of kind of creating that flex diet, sir? And then the uh, physio flex sir, that you have as well too. So the flex, the flex diet, sir, was I had been doing training. I'd done a bunch of e-classes and my research was on metabolic flexibility. I basically transferred from the engineering department. So I was doing a PhD classwork in biomedical engineering and I didn't want to do any more math. I just got tired of doing it. And <laughs> I spent all my free time learning about physiology. So great. I'll go transfer to the exercise physiology department, dropped, you know, five years of education, start over again and get there in day one. And my advisor's like, Hey, we have two new projects and they both involve a lot of math. And he like points at the table. He's like, you math boy, whatever your name is, like, these are your projects now. Um, so I ended up looking at heart rate variability and metabolic flexibility for research. And then on the, the education side, again, back to what we're saying about complexity versus simplicity, you realize that metabolism is not super simple, but I was trying to figure out, okay, how do I explain the complexities of it, but still stay true to the research? but have it be in a message that trainers mm -hmm. can use and explain. And it wasn't as simple as, bro, everybody just does keto mm -hmm. or, you know, everyone just needs to eat less calories. You know, one of my favorite sayings was from Stu Phillips. He's like, it's like, yeah, telling the average person to eat less and move more is like telling a depressed person to just have a nice day. Oh, <laughs> like, man, that's you're, good. <laughs> you're technically correct. <laughs> like you are a hundred percent correct. But he's like, that is the most useless information you could give them. And I think a lot of times in fitness, we have discussions about what is correct or not correct, which is good to have, but it may not be the thing that solves the person's issue. So fast forward to the Flex Diet Cert, I had done some education and I literally just done a product for my list that went horribly. I think in six months, I sold two copies, like just atrocious failure. And so I was doing a two-day seminar with Ryan Lee. I'd done some work with him before and I'm asking him and I'm trying to explain to him what I'm doing. And he's like, oh, you should do a certification. I'm like, man, I don't want to be one of those douchebags in fitness. It's <laughs> like, oh, listen to my certification now. It's not approved by anyone. And, <laughs> and he's like, but you realize trainers will pay for certification as a method to get CEUs and to sure. get educated. And he's like, the reality is you're probably one of the douchebags that people should listen to because you spent 18 years of studying all this <laughs> stuff. And I was like, oh, shit, he's got a good point, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I took that knowledge then and put it into the Flex Diet Cert, gave myself six months to figure out how it was all going to work together and test a bunch of the things out. And uh, yeah, just kind of went from there. Yeah. And I know that those uh, certs that you created are really, really awesome. They're helping out a mm -hmm. lot of like health and fitness Thank coaches. You. So really quick though, where could they find like both of those certs? Yeah. The best place for the flex diet cert is just flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T. And the physiologic flexibility certification is at physiologicflexibility.com. All right. 
So I want to talk to, to Mike, I want to talk about human performance and just you being a human performance specialist. I think this is a really interesting talking point just because let's, if we really think back at this, if we rewind two years back uh, when COVID hit, a lot of businesses closed down, a lot of people were isolated, stuck at home, a lot of jobs went remote. A lot of people's health went kind of in the back burner because they didn't know what to do. They turned to, to you know, different substance abuses uh, to, to cope with anxiety and stress. And again, we've, all, we've already lived in a sedentary life because of innovation as well too, just technology. So what are your thoughts on that? Where do you see that going and kind of what's the solution to end that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would like to think that it's getting better and I hope that it'll move more towards that direction. But to me, it was more of a magnification of underlying problems already. Mm -hmm. um, so you made gyms, you know, potentially inaccessible. So now people had to do stuff at home. Right. Uh, so doing exercise, doing those things, it just became a lot harder for people to do that. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily that the solutions are any different, but I think they are more difficult especially in that environment yeah. right some places it was very hard to even go you know walking you know sometimes getting food was difficult so it just made everything that was already relatively hard for most people to do even um harder and in terms of a solution i would say one of my biggest arguments is i don't like the word optimal mm -hmm. i understand what people s mean when they say it but to me like you can't test anything that's optimal right you guys could say hey Here's $2 million, like, um, how do we get people to be leaner in six months or whatever? Well, there could be this, or there could be that, or we could add this or remove that. But if you came to me and said, okay, here's $2 million, here's protocol A and protocol B, I could then tell you, oh yeah, protocol B is definitely better than A, A is better than B, or there's no difference. So I could tell you out of those two options, which one is better. Mm -hmm. So with clients, I always try to phrase it as, they, they get stuck in optimal of like, oh, it's COVID and oh, bro, I can't, I can't get to the gym two days a week. My gym closed. I don't know how to do body weight stuff. I don't have any weights. I can't buy any weights now. You know, like they're ridiculously over expensive. I can't get a rower or a bike, but they're so stuck on that. It's not going to be optimal. So they don't do anything. Mm, yeah. Mm. And I'm like, hey, maybe you should just go for a walk. You get like 3000 steps a day. Like, oh, but I heard I got to do like, you know, 10,000 is a magical number and I just don't have that much time. And it's like, but if you did 5,000 steps, that's way better than where you're at now. Right. Right. So I think if you just focus on what is better, you'll get eventually to this sort of mythical optimal and better is something that most people can do. And if you just iterate that process of being a little bit better over time, you know, you can get really far doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's great. And honestly, I, I've never really heard that optimal phrase broken down like that. And I like how you just said, even just have different protocols, which I, when you think of optimal too, right, there's really not enough context put on that at times right. to where people, like you said, they, they will go way off the edge or they'll do so little. But if you kind of come to, to peace at, you know, I need to find my level of optimal right now with my current situation with what I have and start start just making some small changes. And I think that's where people would start, you know, actually making progress. Yeah. Most people will, it's the old saying, right? They will underestimate how much they can do in the long term and overestimate how much they can do in the short term. Yep. So if I have new clients who start and they're super motivated and they're literally hitting everything at like a hundred percent for like two weeks in a row most people would be like oh that's amazing that's the world's perfect client i'm like that scares the crap out of me yeah. because i know at some point if something happens like they may go like completely off the wagon entirely mm -hmm. um and that so those people paradoxically i'm trying to pull them back to just like 90 percent yeah i'm trying to like prepare them because something's going to happen to throw them off track um, so yeah, I think if you hit everything at just 90%, like you're going to be pretty good. Like you don't yeah. have to be perfect. Yeah. Right. And again, if you were even eating one green vegetable a week, two is a lot better. Hell that's twice as good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But you get Absolutely. stuck in this optimal of like, Oh, I was told I was supposed to eat four veggies a day. And oh, I went online and I know oh, veggies are toxic now and they're bad for me. And 
yeah, it just gets to be a mess. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I, I heard this somewhere in a podcast where someone said that even like if you if you if you look into different seasons of your life where you're at, even 70%, like 70% progress is still really good. You can get a oh, lot yeah. done, a lot done at 70%. And I just I think people just don't look at it that way. They're just like, oh no, it needs to be 90, it needs to be a hundred to where it's just it's a little, it's a little misleading. Yeah. The, I don't know if I sold this from Charles Saley or not, but the analogy I use with clients is imagine you're driving home and you get a flat tire. You know, most people would go, oh man, that sucks. I'm going to, you know, call and get it fixed or I'm going to break out the jack and change the tire. This, this sucks, but I'm going to fix the tire and I'm going to get back on the road and, you know, a little bit of a delay, but I'll get to where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Like you don't get out with a knife and just slash the other three tires and go, well, I got four tires now and I'm, I'm just effed, you know, <laughs> screw this. Yep. Right. But a lot that's, that's what happened with a lot of people it's kind of all or nothing of yeah yep. i went to a social event and i fell face first into a birthday cake and oh the whole weekend was shot after that yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> it, the, those things happen that, that's okay that's part of life yep but you know can you just get back on track after that and then not to sort of catastrophize everything else that's that's going to happen you know, so again, a lot of it is just sort of a, a mindset thing too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 100%. And I want to stick on this uh, topic of extreme human performance. It is really yeah. interesting. So like we have a lot of business owners, we have entrepreneurs, we have health and fitness coaches that listen to this podcast. How would you break down like what that is like in layman terms, extreme human performance? All right. I know. I know. Why did you stop this video with this right here? If I was on stage, you'd probably be throwing popcorn at me or something like that. Literally give me 20 more seconds. Okay. So what I want you to do now is check out the description box below and join our free Facebook group community. If you are a health and fitness professional, okay, because we have a lot of awesome stuff on there and we actually give away a whole full entire training video on how to build a 12 week online training and nutrition program. Absolutely free. We also give this cool, you know, quick fix business scan. They can literally make you an additional one to two K right away just by filling that out and putting in some of the action steps plus there's some really cool people in there we do some live trainings in there and it's really interactive as well too so check out the uh, link in the description and then back to the yeah it's a term i just came up with because i've always been interested in human performance and another thing is that the the extremes will inform the means but the means won't inform the extremes right so if you think of like when i was doing my engineering degree I was like, why are like automotive companies spending you know, like millions of dollars on like Formula One racing or stock car racing or other things? Yeah, it's promotion. It's good for the brand, all other kind of stuff. I get it, but it's ungodly expensive. And what you learn when you talk to them is that, well, in those extreme environments, we have to solve difficult problems that we didn't really face before. And a lot of the technology kind of eventually makes its way into just the average price, you know, sedan three, four, five, 10 years later. So it was a way for them of, of solving problems and testing things out. And they knew that most of those things would probably transfer to sort of the average vehicle. But you couldn't expect to get a really good average vehicle and expect to learn how to run a Formula One car. Yeah. So it didn't go the other way. Um, same thing if you're designing for um, like exercise equipment. You know, what is the maximum and the min height you want, not just what is the average person who's going to use it. So I always thought, and when I set up assessments like four years ago, the thing I realized was if I set up all my assessments for like pretty high end athletes of different types, then if someone's not at that level, I can pull things out and just scale it back down. But I couldn't scale up from a general population to a high level athlete. It just completely falls apart. So I realized if I look for the constraints, the endpoints, I can scale back um, from that. And then the last part too is that you know, everyone's using their body in some form, you yeah. know, for their job, et cetera. And performance is the one thing that people can relatively control the most, right? The consistency of doing what it is. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy. It can be, hey, I got one more rep on my bench press today. I added five pounds. I lost one pound from yesterday. All these small changes in performance then add up over time and they inform us on what is the adaptation that's happening. So it's saying that, oh, the accumulated behaviors are doing are resulting in a higher level of performance consistently over time. So we know we're probably going in the right direction. If that starts dropping off, then you know something's not quite right. Um, so even like for body comp, like 
you're not going to shove someone in an MRI every day to figure out if they're getting leaner or not. Yeah. Heck, even, you know, DEXA, very complex equipment, yeah, plus or minus several percentage points, right? So it's hard to figure out. But if you can use a surrogate of, you know, your scale weight's about the same, waist measurement's going down a little bit, your performance is getting better, you're moving more weight, you're doing a higher level of endurance performance, your run times are down. Cool. All the indicators say that we're we're going in the right direction. And you can measure those things almost every day. And if you kind of focus on those, to me, that's the fastest way to get to uh, body composition and physique changes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense the way you broke it down like that. So yep. Yeah. So Mike, this is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, so in your newsletter, you, you actually did some really, really cool, like um, three questions, right. That you should ask yourselves. Right. So I'm going to throw this back at you. I don't know yeah. if you answered it like all inside the email, but anyways, I want you to kind of repeat it back though on this podcast and the video uh, portion as well too. So I'm going to ask you the questions. If you could just give me the answers back. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the first question you wrote in there is in your own life, what have you become complacent with? So I'm going to have to ask you that question. Yeah, and I would say, in general, I always in the the pro and the con, right? So, have you ever had a set of behaviors that gets you to a certain goal, <clears throat> but at some point it won't get you any further, All right? So, for me, it was like, ah, you know, if I just sleep less, drink more coffee, listen to louder death metal, like I'll, if I work my way, I'll be able to solve all my problems, and that works pretty good. You can get advanced degrees, you can do all sorts of other stuff. Downside is, is it can be a pretty high cost you have to pay with that. And at some point, you just can't solve the next biggest problem. And so for me, trying to realize that past behaviors were successful, but they may not be continually to be successful in the future. And so for me, the biggest one was just taking more downtime, mm. where it was too easy mm. to put off time to another day. Like I, for, you know, I've struggled to do like, AM meditation off and on for years. Like probably the last three years, I've been pretty consistent. But up until that point, I'm like, oh, you want me to sit and do a Zen style stare at a tree for 10 minutes? Ah, <laughs> worthless. What am I doing? You know? And so then I got to the point of, you know, locking myself in uh, like flow chambers or sensory deprivation chambers for two hours at a time just to force myself to deal with my own brain without any s- stimulus. So just taking that downtime. And then realizing that that actually is valuable. And so for me, like, you know, going kiteboarding, I realized I'm not thinking about other things at all per se, Mm -hmm. but most of like the bigger ideas I have for business and directions and things of that nature will happen during that trip. So I think realizing that downtime and doing other things, learning things, just having fun, that it is a restorative quality. But if you're, especially if you're running your own business, if you have one really good idea that comes out of that, you know, that's probably more than worth that time that was invested. Sure. I think it's really easy to get stuck in the day to day of, oh, yeah. oh man, I've got seven more things to get done and this deadline and that deadline and just kind of pushing everything out to the last minute. Yeah. yeah. I think just a really good tip for even like listeners to, to really um, think about is when you have all this stuff to do, just reframe your mind to say, I get to do this. I don't have to do yes. this. Totally. hundred yeah. percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the catch 22 of just having too many options sometimes is yeah. not the best, but then I always have to remind myself that, oh yeah, this is a good quote unquote problem to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing I tried to change four years ago is when people would ask, how are you doing? I used to say good, but busy. And so I've tried to not use the word busy because yeah. that, it, yeah. my goal is not to be busy. My goal is to be you know, productive and do things that are going to help people and and try to look for more leverage. I mean, it's pretty easy to be busy, but that doesn't mean you're being effective. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Those busy tasks can become those low income, low impact tasks, right? As opposed to being productive, those could be the high income, high impact tasks. Yeah. And it, yeah. Email is one of those things I've had this love hate relationship with. (laughs) It's kind of a necessary (laughs) evil, but you could, I could, you know, you guys could be the same way, right? You could spend your whole day just answering free questions from Instagram, Facebook, you know, newsletters mm-hmm. and random whatever. And part of you feels good. You're like, oh man, I really helped those people. 
But if you step back and look at the leverage that's involved in that, especially yeah. if they're not paying customers, sure. yeah, I'd say it's pretty low. So I did yeah. an experiment where I followed up with people. I gave them very specific advice. It's completely for free. Some of them weren't even on the newsletter. The odds of them ever doing any of it was literally almost like slim to non-existent. And so I realized I'm like, oh, crap. Like, am I trying to make myself feel better by doing some tasks that are not necessarily moving the needle, yep. but they weren't helping that person either. Like they, they didn't do more of the things yeah. to get to their goal. Guilty here of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out what is that line, you know? And so now my little rule is like, you probably have to have some skin in the game. And I'm not saying yeah, there's even a paying customer, but like, if you don't want to sign up for a free newsletter, I don't feel like I need to give you a ton of my time, sure. you know, but to people who have shown that they did the thing and came back three weeks later and like, Hey man, I did the thing, ate, you know, four <laughs> meals of 40 grams of protein. I lost two pounds. What would be the next thing to do? It's like, dude, I'll, I'll help those people all day for free. I don't even care if they buy anything. Yeah. Right. Cause I know they're doing the work and I know yep. they're getting the results and therefore they're going to be able to help more people in the future. Yep. So try to do a better job of segregating that out. Yeah. That's, that's Absolutely. really good. All right. The second question, Mike, that you said in your newsletter was, what have you become tolerant of? I think just more tolerant, unfortunately, of my own behavior of, oh, this will be better next week. <laughs> like everything in the, and it's so hard when you have your own business of that too. So I've tried to do a better job of having hard deadlines and mm looking further out a couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years as to, okay, is this the thing I really want to make a priority or not? You know, for, for example, for this year, I'm helping with the, the triphasic two book with Cal and it's kind of been on and off again for like seven years and in January we restarted again. And so I'm like, okay, this year that is like one of the top projects, which is good because I want to see the book get out. It's got a lot of great information. The hard part is it's never as simple as what you think it's going to be. And then with <laughs> books and big projects that don't sell until later, if you're paid as a percentage of the sales, it's like now you have to figure out a period of time of, ooh, how much am I going to suck it up in the income department and bleed money to get this thing out to hope that it'll be better later. Mm -hmm. But you also know if you never do it, you'll you'll miss out on that opportunity and if it has a fair amount of leverage, you know, like a book and that type of thing. Yeah. So it's always kind of those training things. And then in January, one of the little phrases I figured out is like, how do I decide which of these projects to do? Like I look at income, I could look at impact. And then I realized I'm like, oh, maybe I should do more of the projects that I just love to do. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah. so let me try that for a year and see how that works. And maybe it'll work out amazingly. And you'll look back and like, yeah, that year definitely was worth it. Or you're like, wow. That didn't sell as much as I thought. Like not many people bought it. That kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. But if you still like the process and believe what you were doing is beneficial, there's probably some lessons you could still learn from that and bring forward too. Because, you know, you can never really control the the output per yeah. se or the outcome. You know, you can just do the best you can on what do you think is moving in the right direction and kind of hope from there. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And the third question on there was just, what will you do? You know, so you answered those pretty good. Like what will you do with like first uh, questions one and two, but I just thought those are powerful questions like to ask yourselves, you know, and that's something yeah. I'm going to do too, is I wrote those down because, you know, what have you become complacent with and what are you tolerant of? The, those are really good questions to ask yourself, you know, to really check yourself. So I appreciate you answering those and providing those in your newsletter. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and something I want to just kind of pivot to too, is just, I mean, this, I think a lot of listeners always are curious with different uh, tips and perspective from, you know, successful entrepreneurs like you, all, all the stuff that you've been doing. Right. And we've met your awesome wife, Jody, several yeah, yeah. times, several <laughs> times on zoom. Awesome. Awesome people you guys are. And uh, my question is just like, how do you got, how do you guys find balance between your guys's marriage, you know, to not like let that conflict with, um, you know, all the busy projects that you're working on any tips you can give to the listeners for that? Yeah. So my wife works for the business full-time and has mm -hmm. for five years now. I mean, we've got one other part-time employee, Susie in uh, Colorado and some other contractors, virtual assistant, et cetera. And I think the biggest thing that has helped us is just having better boundaries and communication yeah. of like, for example, we know this next week because I've got a bunch of due, due dates of stuff. 
probably going to be pretty crazy, you know, but we're going to hang out tonight at seven and then we'll hang out tomorrow night at seven. And then, so we'll have a little bit of time in between and we know what that is ahead of time. And then after that point, we'll be with some friends in Weatherford, Texas for a while. So my goal there is to only work like probably two or three hours a day. Yeah. So knowing that, okay, this project is due on this date and then we'll have a little bit more time, you know, after that we'll be in South Padre, Texas doing some kiteboarding and stuff there too. So I think just being clear about what are the goals and looking ahead and making sure that you still also have uh, downtime yeah. because if, you know, if you don't like something will, will fill it. Like, you know, usually (laughs) there's never any fear of that. Like I, we often joked, it's like, we could take like no new projects, no new clients, nothing else. I'm sure we could find stuff to do probably for a couple months easy, Yeah, (laughs) you know, and like, would they really be high value stuff to do? Maybe, maybe not. Um, But I think having more constraints and dedicated times, um, even times where you can just kind of you know, get away. Like we helped my parents yesterday. And so I only worked in the morning and then took that day off, went up there and helped them and then worked the other part of the other day. Yeah. So the good part, if you work for yourself is you can kind of move time and money around. The caveat is I think having some hard constraints of like, okay, what is kind of the limit? Okay. Yeah. We may overextend it this week, but then, okay, coming up, we'll be able to, you know, do something to kind of not really replace that, but make sure that it's still a priority. Right? Yeah, no, that's that's very helpful. And thanks for sharing that because this the the communication and boundaries, I think that's super important, you know, for anyone that's going to hear that. And just sounds like you guys are very intentional about your guys' time, putting on the calendar. Like you said, you guys will hang out tonight at seven, then tomorrow at seven, and literally just no distractions, just be present with one another. And sometimes we often think that we all we need all this like quantity of time, but maybe just focus on the quality of time you have. Yeah. And that's a big thing too, of, I like having a hard deadline. So it's like, okay, I know whatever stuff I need to get done. I have until like say 7 PM tonight. Um, but then once that time comes actually being present at that point and not yeah. being like, Oh, we're hanging out and I'm still working on my laptop or yeah. <laughs> I'm still sending emails on my yeah. phone. And, and beyond that, even like I haven't had email on my phone now for probably five years. I don't have any notifications on other than messaging. Nice. <laughs> Nice. You know, just being kind of ruthless about limiting your amount of inputs. And I think that does help quite a bit and realizing ahead of time, like, okay, how big of a problem is it? And I feel clients like you can email me, I'll get back to you normally in 24, 48 hours. If it's urgent and it's something I screwed up, like you don't know what you're doing at the gym today. Like most of them have my cell phone, like, please text me, you know, but in fitness, there's nothing that's going to be a complete emergency per se. Like if something that bad happens, like you do not want to call me, like call your doctor, <laughs> call 911. Like if it's a true emergency, um, but also just thinking about that stuff ahead of time, because otherwise everything will sort of appear like it's super, super important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't agree more on that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the next thing I want to ask Mike is just um, like, I'm going to go super deep on this, right? This is going to be kind yeah. of more of a lifestyle question on here. Okay. So if you had five years to live, what would you stop doing right now? Ooh, <laughs> I, do I have to make money or not? Uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's put the say, context let, of not making money. Yeah, right now. yeah. Not making money. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I like that. It It's one I've often asked myself, like, what would I do if... I've asked this to clients too. If you won the lottery tomorrow and you didn't have to work, what would you do? Oh, and then if good. you won the lottery tomorrow, but you still had to put in 40 hours a week, what would mm-hmm. you do? Because you're obviously not doing it for the money at that point. Right. But I think there's a a fallacy of, well, you know, if I didn't have to worry about money, I would go to Fiji and I'd sit on the you know beach every day and stare at the water and drink Mai Tais and and uh, most people, I, I personally would take two days of that and I'd be bored out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. Right. It sounds good. Um, we even did like a cruise a couple of years ago and it was great, but I realized that having something to do that I enjoy and I've also realized like I love solving complex problems Yeah, and in fitness, there's never going to be a lack of them. Um, so I taught for a graduate program for a while. And it was great. Like all the professors were were awesome. Like the students were amazing. But I realized I 
I didn't feel like I was helping them enough because paradoxically, the students were too good and their writing was actually really good. And I just felt like I was going through the motion of just yeah, like kind of correcting papers. And I realized I'm like, oh, I'm not solving any problems. So I think I would spend time solving whatever fitness problems there are. And then, yeah, I'd probably spend more time, you know, kiteboarding, hanging out, <laughs> like, you know, more on the recreation side also. Um, but I know I couldn't do that a hundred percent for the rest of my life. Cause I would, not that I wouldn't enjoy it, but I would, I would feel like I'm not being useful. Yeah. Right? And I'm sure you guys are very similar. Like there's so much stuff that like, I have no idea about that. I find just like fascinating, like how anyone yeah. can be bored. It just boggles my mind. Right. <laughs> you know? And so I would take periods of time of which I've tried to do now in terms of outside interests of, okay, I'm going to look at this for this period of time, or now I'm going to shift and do a more deep dive on this type of thing. Um, but probably not anything, luckily, that dissimilar from what I'm doing now. Um, even with client work, I still struggle with that. Like I haven't technically opened my online training for a year and a half to the public. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, this year I let it drop on purpose because of the book and everything else. But even then, like I still got some really good referral clients and like all my clients now are, are awesome. Yeah. You know, so I realized it was like, oh, maybe it was just, you know, those one or two people that were just kind of a pain in the butt that you couldn't figure out how to get through. <laughs> yep. And I don't like the administrative stuff of it. Like I yeah. like solving their problem and then helping them with that. So probably yeah. pretty luckily relatively similar to what I'm doing now, really. Yeah. 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 No, I love all those answers. So, and I couldn't agree with like several of those answers, but um, Mike, we're coming towards the end of this episode and this has been great. And before I ask the last question, I just want to take a moment to commend you. I know this is coming from Chris as well too, yeah. but I mean, just to put context, we, we've known each other for like at least a decade through the ISS yeah, right. through other, through other awesome fitness pioneers in the fitness world. And, you know, uh, just everything I've seen you do and accomplish what you're doing now, I know you and I and Chris are working on collaborating with like your flex uh, diet mm -hmm. certification to our program for fitness professionals. So you know, I just want to just commend you just on everything you've done for the fitness industry, everything you guys are doing going forward. And um, yeah, you know, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your time here and just all your wisdom and perspective. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It's uh, no, it's been cool. Like, especially in fitness, I don't think people realize from the outside looking in, it's, it's relatively small. It is. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems huge, but most people kind of know each other people. And then yeah. if you go, how many people have been doing this for more than two years, five years, 10 years? Like, you, there's not a lot of people left. <laughs> yeah, there's not. <laughs> yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're very yeah. welcome. So where can the listeners connect with you? And just, you know, is there anything that we can support you on here? Yeah, probably the best place is the newsletter. So I generally write for the newsletter six, seven days a week. Uh, it's mostly content-based. You can just go to MikeTNelson.com. There'll be different opt-ins you can get in um, there. Uh, if people have any questions, they can just reach me through there. As usually, they'll come directly to me. And then if they want information about uh, the Flex Diet certification, just FlexDiet.com. And then I have a podcast, which is the Flex Diet podcast. Kind of wide range of everyone from you know, researchers on muscle building, hypertrophy, performance to, you know, some psychological stuff. It's nice. pretty wide ranging and yeah, it's been super fun. I realized since, well, I'm the only one who sponsors the podcast. I don't necessarily have to make money off it. I don't have any sponsors to appease. Oh, maybe I can just call people and have cool conversations. All right. All right so exactly. I'll just do that. <laughs> exactly. Pod podcasting is my jam. So um, once again, we'll have all that plugged up in the show notes and guys go, go take a look at what Mike's doing. He's doing some awesome stuff and we'll have all those resources for you guys. But once again, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me and all the projects and look forward to working with you more. I really appreciate it. You're yeah, very welcome, you Mike. All, all right, guys. guys. Until next time. Hopefully you got one, two, three, four, five or extreme amounts of gold and nuggets with that conversation with Dr. Mike T. Nelson. All right. If you guys like that conversation, check out this next conversation and interview we did with Dr. Lane Norton. He was our coach for five years. Awesome, awesome guy. He talks about how he would sit there in recession and future proof his business if he lost it all. Check it out.